Hi again everyone, this is Kelly Thompson and this particular video um, was built with the intent to show you some of the research-based strategies for student interactive vocabulary. Um, these particular strategies uh, have been proven to be effective in helping students to improve their understanding of these terms and their ability to use them in context. So I hope you will find something worthwhile in the video and there are a lot of strategies built in for you to choose something that will be effective to your particular goal, your unit, um, and the choice of your classroom. So let's get started. It's important again to begin with the why and research shows us that explicit and deliberate instruction of the tier two and three vocabulary results in access and equity for all of our learners regardless of what their home life or their parent supports may be. And again, we can't assume that students understand what we're asking them to do if they are unfamiliar or uncertain of that academic tier two term. To review, tier one vocabulary is that vocabulary of everyday speech, which generally does not require direct or deliberate instruction. Tier two vocabulary is that universal academic vocabulary and they are generally those terms that we use in a skill or verb. So for example, summarize, speculate, debate, compare. And tier three vocabulary is that vocabulary that is specific to your content area. And generally speaking, it will be new to the student um, when they enter your classroom. It is also important for us to point out that the vocabulary is not in and of itself the goal. Deliberate instruction of Tier 2 and Tier 3 vocabulary is simply the action step to support each of us to achieve our SLO, our building goal, to help students to improve their overall achievement in whatever course they are enrolled in. And as indicated by these uh, photos of achievements by our very own Everest students, we want all students to have high achievement. We want them to have authentic learning opportunities. And part of that starts with them understanding what skills we are asking them to achieve to. So again, this reminds us that wide reading alone or just assuming students will use um, limited strategies such as relying on context clues, uh, those are not effective methods to approach vocabulary instruction and acquisition. And this is particularly true for our students who do not have wide exposure to academic English vocabulary in the home, and most frequently, those are our students who come from low-income households. And so again, research over and over shows us that uh, in order for students to be able to use and transfer vocabulary effectively, they have to have explicit, scaffolded, and interactive instruction. And that comes from the research of Kinsella, 2010, and Fisher and Frey, 2014. Um, and then this little piece of evidence here um, is a little disturbing in that just between grades one and three, our low SES students' vocabularies will increase by about 3,000 words per year, while middle class students' vocabularies increase by about 5,000 words per year. So again, the research shows us that our low SES students are at a fairly large disadvantage if they are in classrooms that do not utilize direct instruction of the critical tier two and content tier three vocabulary. Therefore, the goal of this video is to provide you with general overarching strategies to ensure that we are all using uh, academic tier two and content specific tier three vocabulary as an action year long to help us to meet our student learning growth goals. And then of course, the second part will give you some specific strategies. Um, and those strategies are based on research on word acquisition tenants. And under each of those acquisition tenants, there will be strategies for you to choose from that are appropriate to the unit you may be teaching, the content you may be teaching, or the purpose of your instruction. So let's get started with some general overarching strategies. So I grouped together these following two next slides or screenshots so that you could easily come back to reference them. And again, these are just general overarching suggestions for how academic vocabulary is deliberately instructed and used in your classrooms. And so again, this might be a list that you would start from. Certainly it isn't a 
uh, comprehensive list. Your building principal might have more strategies, your curriculum coordinator, um, but of course we have to start someplace. So here are the first five bulleted uh, points. Um, the first one is simply saying that the term should be used consistently in your teacher speak to students. Um, don't use kids speak. Don't think kids can't understand the term. Um, they can if you deliberately instruct it and you use it frequently. And that's the same point in the second bullet. You want to identify those terms by unit for students and they should frequently be um, appearing on the unit overview, they're on student handouts, they're up on the Apple TV, they're in the materials, and students start to get used to seeing them frequently. You might want to put the terms for the unit on a word wall. Um, I would suggest using the term in a warm-up activity, and I did this frequently when I taught AP Language and Composition and English um, 9th through 10th. Um, if you use it as a warm-up activity, it was a quick time for me to take attendance. I had kids up out of their seat talking about it, um, seeing if they could define, if it was a visual image, could they define that particular term, etc. And then you would be identifying two key strategies, and those strategies will be coming in the latter half of this presentation. So just two strategies per unit, and you would work on implementing those strategies into the activities of that unit's lesson or discussion. The next four overarching strategies or look-fors um, would again all fall under that idea of you're really looking for student interactive instruction and activities. So students and teachers are actively engaged in using the vocabulary in the class instruction. And I think it's key to point out here that this is not a new implementation. We're not asking you to teach yet another um, topic. We're asking you to deliberately teach what you're already asking kids to do. When you ask a kid to compare and contrast, it's already inherent in your unit. Um, we just want to make sure that students understand those terms. And then these next few may be specific to your building or your building principal, but suggestions include faculty meetings, pairing teachers with other content teachers to share their strategies and approaches. And of course, hopefully you're sharing strategies and approaches if you have a PLC. Um, Walkthroughs can be very powerful. And this is especially true if a teacher goes into another uh, content area and looks for uh, ways that that teacher may have embedded or taught that uh, tier two and tier three vocabulary. And then of course, continued utilization of those strategies with the idea of focusing on two strategies per unit. Okay, so we have some look-fors in each of our classrooms and now uh, we'll move on to the research-based instructional strategies that we know are student interactive that actually do have positive learning outcomes. And while I don't want to focus on the ineffective strategies, I think it's important for us to take a quick look here. Um, these 10 strategies have been proven as ineffective and probably those of us who are a little bit older remember actually doing some of these um, either as teachers or students ourselves. Um, for instance, having a student look it up in a dictionary only to confuse them even further because they've chosen the wrong definition or simply copying words down. We know these strategies do not work. They are considered passive strategies. The strategies we will look at are student interactive. So as we move on to effective strategies that are student interactive, I recommend uh, using this uh, clever little, I call it a cheat sheet. It comes from the Department of Public Instruction and it actually walks you through the process for selecting vocabulary words and strategies to teach. And so you can see there in the first row you have your tier one, tier two, and tier three words. And then looking at select words for instruction identifying the extent to which students know the words because remember, we want to raise the bar for students and we do not want to assume that they need the words, um, for lack of a better term, dumbed down or simplified or put into kids speak. We want all kids, for example, if you have a student who has a reading disability um, or you have a student who's reading at a basic level in your classroom, there's no reason they shouldn't hear the same tier two vocabulary words as their peers. So for example, if the word is summarize, you're still going to teach that student what summarize means, but the level at which they're able to summarize might be more simplistic. Another example would be synthesize. Maybe you're synthesizing sources, but for the advanced student, 
It's a very high level sources and high level thinking, high level ideas. Whereas the lower student is still synthesizing, but it might be at a more basic level. Again, we want all students to access these words. And then if you take a look in the bottom row, you have actual instructional practices. So that would be your direct teacher instruction, your modeling. Classroom strategies, so that would be the specific idea of scaffolding practice for students with that gradual release for assessments. And it's important for me to point out one more time that we won't be able to directly or statistically prove that using this strategy will result in achievement for students, but I think we'll be able to make those um, claims as we start to see students improving in the level of what they're able to show us. So the first step of effective vocabulary instruction on the teacher's part is to facilitate a classroom that really promotes a word consciousness, that really gets kids thinking about thinking, what vocabulary words do they know, what vocabulary words do they need help with, what do they do when they are engaged in an activity where they don't know the vocabulary word, how do they proceed. So again, we want kids to think about their own thinking. To facilitate word consciousness, Graves and Watts' TAF work identifies a framework of six categories critical to effective literacy development. So those teachers create a word-rich environment. They recognize and promote adept diction, which is important because if you consider the child is unable to pronounce the word, chances are he will not learn how to use the word. They promote word play, and if you don't like the word word play, which is more elementary, then secondary teachers might say word practice, engaging word activities, engaging in activities that use the word, uh, using the word through writing. Uh, again, research shows us that when we have to write down ideas or thoughts, we become much more adept at them. They go into our long-term thinking. We want to involve students in our original investigations about the word, how to use the word correctly, and we want to teach students continually about new words. Starting out with a simplistic activity to help kids understand or promote word consciousness, you can have them do a vocabulary rating and this works really well with elementary and middle school students. Um, you simply have a word scale and they can simply rate the word a one, two, three, or four. You could also have these younger students uh, show their understanding of the word on the fifth to five rating scale and this scale can be used throughout the duration of the unit as the students become more familiar with the word. For older students, you can use a knowledge or metacognition chart. So here's a particular chart that comes from a high school history class and simply prior to beginning the unit, you might have the students um, self-identify where they fit with each term. And as the unit goes on and you do more work for them to become um, aware of the term, they can go in and change their ratings. And this is particularly helpful as they prepare for assessments. And here's yet another example of promoting metacognition or word consciousness. And this one comes from a high school, um, I believe it's a biology course. And you'll notice the vocabulary terms are listed. Again, the student rates him or herself as the unit goes along. Of course, these are tier three vocabulary words. Um, these words could even be categorized. You could ask students to categorize them um, by general subtopic to help them understand the word as the unit moves on. And a classroom that continues to foster metacognition or student reflection of their own thinking on vocabulary includes instructional um, strategies that directly introduce the word and how it is being utilized in a context, continually modeling multiple uses of the word in a variety of different contexts, sharing models of text where others have utilized the word, and discussing the purpose for using the word in that particular context. And then in moving away from teacher-centered direct instruction into more partner group collaborative strategies for ensuring students have rich understanding of tier two and three words. Here is the section from that DPI chart and you'll notice they give you some examples of classroom strategies. I just want to point out that the very first uh, wide reading and writing 
is just one component and it cannot stand alone. Um, we know that for students to understand deliberate uses for tier two and tier three vocabulary, there has to be multi-purpose um, activities, starting again with that direct teacher instruction and then scaffolded for them to have many activities to practice and deeply learn the term in its context. And so a lot of you already use these strategies. It's just a point of remembering and ensuring that we all use them deliberately through a unit. And so you might use uh, word maps, you might use concept circles. Many of you have used tra uh, tools of word maps such as the Freyer model. You might have anticipation guides. Um, so I'll share some of those with you. And of course, they are just a beginning list. You can find many online and in many other sources. But again, the whole purpose here is for all of us to be deliberate and ensure that we are using these strategies to ensure all kids have access to these academic terms. As you implement these strategies to support students in their learning, um, some of the more common tried and true graphic organizers consists of the Fourier model, a concept and definition mapping, and this gives students not only an in-depth um, insight into what that word truly means, but it also gives them that opportunity to write. And again, we know that when students are asked to um, put their thinking processes into writing, they are more apt to actually learn the skill, the word, the term that you are instructing, and they're more likely to um, store it in their long-term memory. And here is another example. Many of you have probably already used this. Here's a semantic features map. Again, you'll notice already that even the semantic features map is using tier two academic vocabulary. Um, and that's what we want. We want students to know those higher level words that can be translated across curricula and into their real world, um, particularly when we talk about having academic success for all kids and as we work to um, ensure all students are college, um, work, and career ready. And many of you already use word sorting charts for students, and these are particularly helpful at the elementary or early level grades. Um, you can do everything with beginning readers. Um, and you'll notice here we're already using some of these tier two words. We're ensuring that students understand what it means to sort, how to label categories, you could also use word sorts for upper grade levels. Um, an example would be um, labeling the branches of government and all of the academic tier three words that you would classify or categorize under those different subheadings. Here are some sample strategies and they actually do work with older learners as well. You can do the word colors activity, the word illustrations activity, Students enjoy these, especially those who are visual learners. Other creative strategies might be dramatization of words, and this can happen in the upper levels as well. Um, students attach a story to the word and then they physically act it out, so you're also getting students up and moving in your classrooms. There's an example here from a high school math class. Students pretend to walk up a mountain to demonstrate positive slope, walk back down to de demonstrate zero slope, and then they fall off a pretend cliff to represent undefined slope. Certainly you can use music. Students can write a rap of the vocabulary definition. Um, students could use the vocabulary and install a vocabulary story into a favorite song with new lyrics. This is actually something I had to do about uh, reading instruction in a class at the postgraduate level, and I certainly memorized those terms as a result. Other interactive strategies include creating vocabulary games, and these could be very specific to a unit. For example, if you are studying the circulatory system in biology, the students would have to use the game to summarize or synthesize how the parts work together and what the results are. Um, I've used multimedia approaches before and of course many of you have used these approaches as well. Um, I've used um, not only Google presentations where students keep an ongoing slideshow of the new vocabulary and at times I'll choose a student to airplay it and share it with their peers with um, contextual and visual images. 
Um, but I've also gotten to the point where I no longer write the cahoots. I have, when we have new vocabulary terms, the students create the cahoots, and one of the requirements is not only the text, the context, but also visual aids. Additional ideas for your more visual learners, and some of you, again, probably already use these strategies, would be to have them illustrate um, the tier two, tier two and tier three words um, as they are summarized or synthesized um, in processes or procedures. So here you have the water cycle and climate change. So then to sum up this presentation, I just want to reiterate that active engagement with vocabulary, as with any kind of concept or any kind of instruction, is really what gets kids to understand and deepen their retention and their learning. And so this is really not an English language arts initiative whatsoever. These are the terms that students need across all subject areas to be successful. And we also need to ensure that we are deliberately um, teaching them and providing students multiple strategies to learn them because these are the same terms that students need to be college, career, and workplace ready. And so as I tie it up here, I just want you to um, understand that we're really looking at the idea of consistency for our students with this action step. And we're also looking at the idea that less is more. So you really want to focus in on those few key terms, their upper level terms, but we want all students to understand them and we want all students to have access to them. So again, it's not just the select few advanced students who get to learn what the word synthesis means. All students get to learn what synthesis means at the appropriate grade level. It's just that sometimes students might need a different context or content. So with that being said, I will provide links to some of these graphic organizers. Certainly, you can find these anywhere and everywhere on the internet. Um, again, this strategy is one that many, many school districts have used and have found success with. So thank you. And last but not least, if you want to check out any of the references here, um, I use these in my presentation. Um, but I will certainly put together a more user-friendly um, document where you can actually download some of the P PDFs that were referenced in this video. Thanks, everyone.